that talk, we help entrepreneurs deliver exceptional presentations. So it's presentations that get picked up by investors, help them close massive sales deals, or formulate complex partnerships, or even win competitions like the one startups are going to be competing in tomorrow and after tomorrow. And it's one thing to put great effort and thought into growing the business, but it's another thing to put effort and thought into communicating that growth and being able to show the effort you've put to the audience that is listening to your idea, to your project, or your business. And that's where we see a lot of people fall short. So they do great and amazing achievements, but once they start talking to their audiences, people start losing interest and they don't see the potential that this company can actually achieve. And here is where we come and help people to overcome this situation. Now, to deliver a great presentation, you need to work on three things in most cases. The first one is to develop some interpersonal skills that allow you to communicate your ideas with charisma and with passion. And the second thing is to choose the content that you're saying. And it's not just content that explains your idea, but it's content that sells your idea, that makes people engaged with it and want to know more about it. And the third element is the visuals. So choosing visuals behind you that are clear and help you convey the message to your audience easier and faster. Now, let me tell you a story. We've been coaching executives and entrepreneurs over the last four years. We've been working with entities like the famous TV show Shark Tank, with huge corporates like Dell and IBM. And we've been doing trainings to thousands of people. And one story in specific I always remember. I was a few years back hosting a startup competition in Madrid. And I was introducing a speaker, he was the VP of a startup, and they had pitched the year before in the competition and they lost significantly. And it was a huge disappointment. And one year later, they chose to compete once again, and I introduced them, they had the stage for a few minutes, and while they were pitching, everyone was listening. No one was talking, everyone was listening very attentively. Once they were done, people started clapping and clapping and then they gave them a standing ovation. And while I was going back up on stage, I heard one of the judges telling the other, wow, that was amazing. So I have a question. In your opinion, what makes a perfect pitch deck? A perfect presentation that hooks the audience and sticks in their mind. I don't want you to answer right away. I'm going to give you two minutes. I want everyone to work with his partner, the person sitting next to him, introduce yourself, and bring me as many points as you can. So what makes a different a difference? What makes a confident presentation that people want to know more about the topic afterwards? Things in the speaker, things in the content, and the visuals, what in your opinion makes the difference? Let's try. So you have two minutes, introduce yourself, the person next to you or behind you, and come up with as many points as you can. Everyone's done? All good? All good? Whoops! Alright, let's have a quick discussion, so any ideas? Okay, uh, from my point of view, uh, I have two points to consider. The first one is how much I believe in my idea. And the second one 
so how much am I, the problems that I deal with, say, open for me, I mean, for me, simple. Yes, okay, so let me make a quick comment to the points you guys come up with. So the first one is passion. They say the elements of a great presentation consist of three things, logos, ethos, and values. Logos has to be logical. Ethos has to be emotional and pathos it needs to show passion. So if you have, if you if you see a good presentation, it's one that has those three elements. If it lacks the logic or the emotion or the passion, usually people will fall short from you. They won't pay attention to the end of the presentation. So these are three things you need to focus on. Now the second thing you said you need to show that the problem is relevant to a large segment. Always remember this point, a presentation, it's not about you, it's about the audience. So it's not about the problem that you see, it's a problem that's affecting them. It's a problem that once you say they should relate to it, you should choose the content accordingly. How can you make it relevant to them and feel the urgency and frequency of that problem? So if it's something that happens once every few years, they might not be very appealing to it. But if it's something that occurs frequently, then it's more important. If it's very urgent, then it's more important. So you need to keep on taking it to that urgency and frequency on the problem. Okay, what else? So it's like telling to the self story, personal story, to the, the people on the side and connect, and connect with that. Uh, the story. The yes. Now, there's a point here. They always say facts tell but stories said. So it's not just about saying a number of facts and make these facts constitute the presentation. It's about building a story behind these facts. It's not just about the numbers or the points or the statistics. It's about the story behind it. And always remember the first point. You need to make it relevant to the audience. So sometimes we see an issue that's very common where speakers they come up on stage and they start relate, say, relating their own personal stories and they become, they make it too personal. So people usually don't know who you are yet, they're not really interested in you yet, but they're interested maybe in your experience because it might be relevant to them. So if you're gonna relate something about yourself, it has to be something that's still very relevant to the audience. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, so when you start a presentation, there are many ways to do it in a way that actually engages and attracts the attention of the audience. So there are three ideas that you can start presentations with. From the third place, it's a question. So asking a question that makes people wonder. So it's not just a normal question or a question that people don't really care about, but it's a question that makes them wonder, want to know more. The second best option is to start with a shocking fact, something people never imagined before. So did you know that more than half of the population of the world are actually facing depression that can lead to suicide? So choosing the right fact that introduces your talk. Now, the top and foremost of these ideas is telling a story. People love to hear stories. So once you start start relating the story, people start to pay attention. They want to know more about your idea. People love stories about characters. That's the most loved type of stories. And then places, and then ideas, or companies, or whatever. Because people love to see a hero always as a challenge, who's overcoming that challenge by creating a solution that didn't exist before, and so on. Right, these are all great points. Anything else? Yeah. 
guessing that the court was Yes, exactly. Now, there's a point here. So, we're talking about the content. You need to be very comfortable with the content that you say, so that while you're on stage, you're able to communicate it easier and faster. Now, when you're speaking in front of a group of people, your mind is divided into two parts. Audience and content. One of those gets 90% of your attention and the other gets 10%. Which one do you think should take the 90% of your attention? The audience or the content? Audience. Okay. Audience. Okay. Depends? Okay, depends on what. You want to achieve. You really want to be heard the 90% of your audience, which is what most people want to achieve. But if you want your content to be written down on record, then the content is one. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. Well, 90% should be on the audience. So you should be focusing all of your attention on the people in front of you. Unless, of course, there's an exceptional case like you were mentioning. You know what that means? That means that you need to be very, very prepared so that while you're speaking on stage in front of a group of people, you're only putting 10% of your attention to the content and yet you're still saying it in a way that is structured, that is easy to consume, and that is engaging to them. And 90% you're putting it with the audience. What do we mean by the audience? Putting the right and proper body language to engage them. Paying attention to your voice so that they don't get bored. Communicating with them, interacting with them, all of these things. Okay, let's take one more point from back then. What did you guys come up with? Yeah. Any ideas? Any ideas? Yes, exactly. Body language. So that's a very, very important element. So while we're speaking about body language, here's an interesting fact. Yeah. 55% of a person's charisma lies in his body language. 55%. So if you have an excellent content, if you have a perfect, perfect presentation, and yet you don't communicate with body language, you lack charisma. Now, let me prove this to you. I'm going to do something, and I want you to listen to me, okay? I want you to do exactly like I'm going to tell you. Right? So I want everyone in the seats to do like this. Take a step back. Right? Now I'm gonna count to three. And once I count to three, I'm gonna tell you something, listen to it very carefully, and do exactly like I'm gonna tell you. Right? Right. One, two, three. Touch your shoulders! <laughs> Shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> See, not a single person got it right. You know why that happened, guys? Because there's a fact people <laughs> would see first and then they listen. So all your eyes are always faster than your ears. So once I did something, you saw it, you replicated it exactly as I did it. And then you heard. So you, you start noticing that you did a mistake. So you touch your shoulders after that. That's the, the difference between body language and tonality. So imagine you're in a presentation, you're talking and talking and talking and talking and talking, and you're just making it so hard for people to pay attention because the full focus is on their ears. Imagine how easier is it if you make it visual. They can actually see it with their eyes. It's going to be faster and it's going to be easier. All right? That's why body language has 55% of a person's charisma. 38% goes to tonality, the tone of voice, and only 7% goes to the content. So a good presentation is only attributed to 7% of the content. So it's never really about what you're saying, it's about how you're saying it. And here's a mistake we see people do a lot. They're preparing for a presentation, they keep preparing on what they're going to say. They memorize the content. 
keep practicing on what exact words they're going to say, but they never practice how they're going to say it. What body language are they going to do at that certain sentence? What tone of voice is going to make the difference? They don't say we're going to come here at this number and say it with a higher volume so that people would listen to it. Or we're going to come at this point and whisper. Grab people's attention. So people don't really practice on how they're going to say things, even though that's the thing that makes the most difference. Okay, great. So these are all very good points. And just to summarize everything we said, now, we can say that there are three key pillars for a great presentation, all right? So everything we said, they lie under three main titles. The first item is you, the presenter. So what you do with your body language, what you do with your voice, how you move on stage, your confidence, all of these things. Now, the second thing is the script that you say, the content. So there's a difference between someone who's actually explaining an idea and someone who's selling that idea. Make, making it very engaging and attracting people to you. So you could communicate the same idea, but I can make one person want to know more about it, and you can make him very bored and doesn't want to know anything about it. Now the third one is the visuals. So choosing the right slides behind you that help you communicate the idea. And there's a key tip here that I want you to know. You guys are designers, right? So you don't need to do very attractive slides, or beautiful slides. It's not your job. You need to make them clear, concise. They say that good slides are ones that we record this presentation to the camera, for example, and then we mute the speaker and watch any moment in the presentation. We should still know what title he's talking about, what point he's in at the moment. Okay? So these are the three key points. Now, the skills that you should master to be able to communicate ideas easier, whether with investors, customers, partners, or whoever audience you, can, you talk in front of, the first one is confidence, and that's very, very important. Okay? So it's not whether you are nervous, because that's normal if it's a very important presentation and your life depends on it, you're going to get a huge round of funding, for example, but it's whether you show it. So there are tactics. I'm going to give you a few tips during the presentation that no matter how anxious you are, if you have stage fright, things you could do that will make you look more confident in front of people. Now, the second thing is the storyboard. Because always remember, facts tell, but stories sell. Now, the third one is body language. Because as we said, it's 55% of your charisma. So that's one of the most important skills you need to master and practice on. The third, the fourth one is tonality, so your voice. You guys, of course, notice in presentations when you're always bored to death because the speaker is very monotone. So it's the same exact tone for one hour, two hours. So maybe through, or maybe before the middle of the presentation, you're so bored you don't want to continue, but you have to. That's the tone. It's so monotone. So how to change the tone of your voice? I'm going to give you a few tips on that as well. Now, eye contact. Now, the thing about eye contact is that it makes presentations personal. It shows the audience that you care, and it establishes a personal connection with each and every single one in your audience. There are famous politicians, when they study their eye contact, they show how much they care to a certain uh, movements in their eyes. So once they want to, to tell the audience that they care about a certain situation, they narrow down their eyes. Show them that they care because they know what you're talking about. Right? And maybe he's lying, but that narrowness in his eyes establishes a connection. When you look at someone as an odd where you're looking, you're telling him I get you, I understand what you say. That's all eye content. Now, the sales content. So, it's a great thing to explain your idea, but a common mistake that you see people fall into is that they get too technical. They want to talk about the effort, they want to talk about the business, the project they're communicating. So, they get too technical, they keep on explaining, but they stop communicating the value behind it. 
So why it has been it has been done? So it's not what you've done, it's why you've done it that matters. And I'm gonna give you a few tips on how to switch the content from the what to the why during this session. Now, that's a key point, the key one is, you know when you deliver a great presentation, so you've done all of that, and then it's time for the questions and answers, and the audience strikes with very tough questions. If you get that question wrong, it questions the credibility of the whole presentation. Right? And it's always very disappointing. I've done the hard part, I've done the presentation. And then they start throwing away questions. Sometimes they're very antagonistic. Sometimes they're very challenging. Sometimes you don't have the answer. And you need to deal with all of them. So that's a skill you need to master. You can still answer questions if you don't have answers to them in a way that doesn't provoke the audience and gives them what they're looking for. I'm going to share a few things around that as well. And then finally, the visuals will have to make them clear, concise, and easy to communicate with the body. Now, when speaking about startup pitches, there are three main issues that we see. Those are the most common issues that we see. So the first one is overselling, over presenting. So you find the speaker moving from one point to the other and then back to the person. He tries to oversell the idea. He keeps on speaking about his value. He's communicating the value and he's communicating it in the wrong way. It's not that he's giving the right examples or the right stories or the right uh, business potential about the idea. No, he's actually reiterating around the same points and doing that a lot in a way that makes people feel like he's too, uh, he's too in need of the funding or of winning the competition or of whatever. Now, the second thing, missing content. So you need usually to deliver a start of pitch in three to five minutes. Most pitches are that long. So you need to communicate a lot of ideas and you need to do that in a very short span of time. Right? So what happens is that they usually throw away content important points that they have to say, but they think that they don't have enough time to say it, so they just drop it out. So maybe it's short, but it still has to include everything that should be included. And there are 12 points that should be included. I'm going to tell you about those points in the next slide. Now the third one is extremely important. It's the what-why crisis. They communicate the what, what they've done, but they don't communicate why they have done it which is way more important, way more important. So it's about the value, not about the effort. So if you put very limited effort, and you've done very limited traction, but you have an extremely valuable output, that's way more important than the other way around. Okay? Now, what should be included in a startup pitch? There are 12 essential components of an investor pitch deck that you should have and you should know by heart. So 12 points, no matter how long the presentation, even if it's a one minute elevator pitch, you should still have all of these points included. Now the first one is one of the most important points. It's the hook and the problem. So in the first 30 seconds of your presentation, you want to hook the attention of the audience, right? You want to hook their attention and you want to choose the content that makes them want to listen to the, to, to the end of the presentation. Now, how can you do that? There's a very important concept. It's called the start of why. It's been talked about extensively by a famous author and writer called Simon Sinek. And I recommend that book because it changes your life. Now, in that book, Simon Sinek explains that there's something called the golden circle. Now, what's the golden circle? He says that 90% of people when they start a presentation or any type of communication, maybe a marketing campaign or something, they usually start with the what they're going to talk about. So they introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Mohamed. They can talk. Today, I'm going to talk to you about presentation skills and about investor pitch skills and about how to deliver a great presentation to your audience. Now, that's the what I'm going to talk to you about. 
but it's not the why. So if you're a startup founder and you're looking for funding, for example, that's something you really, really need to succeed in your job. I should start by saying hi, I'm Omar Hamed from Pretendo. I have entrepreneurs, secured huge rounds of funding, and I help them do that very quickly and in a way that attracts the attention of many investors. Now, they still don't know that I do that through pitch decks. They still don't know that I do that through presentation skills or communication skills. But they know for sure that they want a huge round of funding. So now they want to listen to understand how I actually do it. So when I say I do it through something, they want to know more about it. So Simon Sinek says that 90% of people they start with the what. Almost 7 to 8% start with the how. So they start by saying how something is done. And only 2 or 3% start with the right into, which is the why they do what they do. And he argues that there are three things that most people in life want. So if you ask anyone what he wants in life, they say something that lies underneath one of those factors. It's either success, they want to become more successful, happiness, they want to be more relaxed, happier, whatever, or freedom, freedom in choice. So they have to do something a certain way and you're proposing an easier way, for example. And he says if you want to start a presentation, you should ask yourself, why is what I'm going to say important to me? Why would they want to listen? Okay, it's going to make them more successful. You ask yourself another why. Why is it going to make them more successful? Because it's going to help them um, improve their sales numbers. And that's going to make the company more profitable. So when you start, tell the audience, hello, this presentation, I'm going to tell you a way that you make your company more profitable and increase your sales revenues by 20% annually. And it's a way that you can do and store it right away. Now, if they're interested in that, they're going to start listening. And we once had a customer, they were very technical. They were working in an advanced technology uh, industry. And it was a pod building platform. So it's a platform where anyone can go create his own chatbot for his own business. So that he would improve his customer satisfaction rates and replace the, the normal call centers that we were usually used to. And they had a huge issue that people never understood what they were talking about. So once they went to talk to customers, they started telling him that he does great, that he can do chatbots. The customer would always ask them, okay, what's a chatbot? He had no idea. So it was always a very hard conversation. They couldn't close any sales leads and they wanted a way to change that. So they came to us for coaching and we looked at the presentation. And the first thing we've done, we changed the hook. We changed the why. You shouldn't go to a customer and tell him that you're a bot building platform that allows him to build chatbots. Because he doesn't care about that. What does he care about? That's how they start the presentation out. Hello, my name is Omar from Company X. We help you improve your retention rates by X percent annually. And we do that while reducing both the operation and the marketing costs that you have to spend every month. But the good news is, you can do all of that without hiring any technical talent in your team. Because we're going to handle it for you. Now, the company only wants to know how they actually do that. We still haven't told him that we do chatbots. We still haven't told him that we're a platform. But we told him the things that he cares about the most. Improving retention rates, decreasing operations, and marketing costs. Right? And he doesn't want to hire people to do that. So we make him feel safe about this point as well. So that's the book. Then you go to the problem. and the problem, you need to show how urgent and how frequent it happens. How it actually affects him. He feels the problem is going to want to take action. So you need to build a compelling reason to act. That's what we call it. It's not a problem, it's a compelling reason to act. Why should I act now? Now, the second thing you should include in a pitch deck is the solution. 
And the key tip here is to show how innovative it is. So it's not just a solution, you know, it's different. It is a value proposition behind it. And you need to show that value. So you don't just say, okay, we're an e-commerce platform that matches cars, spare part dealers with end users. That's not enough, because there are many platforms that might be doing something very similar, right? What you want to say, we're an e-commerce platform that matches spare part dealers with their end users, while guaranteeing three things. Seamless client integration, an AI engine, that gives you the right recommendations to the closest dealer to you and ensuring financial transparency between all partners. And we're the only platform that gives you all three. Now, it sounds different. For an investor, at least he's going to want a challenge. He's one, he want to try to see if there are other competitors who do so. He's going to want to listen how you've actually done it. He's going to want to listen to your numbers to see if they're true, and so on. So you show the value. Now the third thing is the target market. So you need to say, this solution is targeting who? And the key tip here is to make it as specific as possible. So if it's an, uh, a startup in the education sector, it's an ed tech company, and they say that they target students, that's very big. They say that they target university students, that's still very big. But you want to say that it's an ETA company that's targeting private university students in Cairo, struggling to pay their fees, and they have to pay it multiple times a year. And those are located in almost 26 universities in that space. So you've made it very specific in demographics. So now people know exactly your target audience and if they actually uh, have potential, enough potential for the company to grow. Now, once you've communicated who you're targeting your idea to, that's very important. What's the size of that market? So is it actually an attractive market? Is it actually a sexy market to invest in for the investor? Now the key tip here is that it's not just about the number of the people, because they can be a limited number of people, but you should link that number of people to the market value they represent. We were once working with a startup in the music industry in Egypt, and they, they were doing a very specific solution to music producers. So there are almost 10,000 people, that's very limited. However. Each person spends annually more than a million Egyptian pounds on the alternative way of producing music without the solution. So a million, that's 10,000, that's a whole lot different type of investment. So it's not just about the number of people, it's about the market value they represent that you should work by heart. <coughs> now once we are clear on the problem, the solution that solves it, who it's targeting, and how big that market is, you should start communicating how it works. And by how it works, the tip here is to show it how simple it is, right? You want to show how simple the solution is. You don't want to make it sound complicated with lots of technicalities. You want to say that in just a matter of three steps, anyone can be using my solution. All he has to do is download the application, make a profile, once he uploads his content, you'll just get the right. And maybe that's not the, the real truth, but that's the way you want to make it sound. You want to choose the steps that make things sound very simple and very easy to use and friendly to the end consumer and very accessible to them. Now, number six is your edge. So, what's the differentiators? What are the unique selling points? There might be competitors direct and indirect to your solution, and you need to have something that is very different from what they do. Now, the tip here is that you need to make it tangible. So you don't just say we're better quality, or we have better pricing. Because these are things that anyone can say, right? 
So I do better than <coughs> say I have the better product. Even if you have a better price, what does that mean? What if they do a discount? Are you guys now very similar? So it has to be tangible. It has to be something that you have, that you own, and they own. Or it has to be a different point of view. So for example, you're attacking a different class of society than the ones they're targeting. A different geography than the one they're targeting different culture than the one they're targeting, a different business model, for example. So you can be targeting the same people with the same idea, but we are subscription-based, people have to pay every month, and you're transaction-based. So that's something your customers want more, for example. Now then, the business model. How do you generate your revenues? So is it a monthly subscription fee? Is it a transaction-based fee? A revenue sharing model. What is the model? How do you generate money? And we always give tips here to entrepreneurs, pitching to investors. You need to show that your business model is diverse and sustainable. Right? So it's not all dependent on one line of business. And if it falls short, your company is over. But we want to show that there is diversity and it's sustainable. It's the type of model that constantly generates revenue for every single month. Now then, an important point also is the marketing strategy. So you go to market, how do you actually reach that target audience with that business model to sell your solution? So what's the strategy you use for the go to, the go -to market? So is it a hybrid model? Is it an online model? You use growth hacking techniques to reach people before they're able to reach you? What are the, the, the efforts that you're putting to reach your end customer? Now that's one of the most important parts, especially for investors. So the traction, what are the numbers that you have achieved today? What are the revenues you've done? What are the growth rates? So you made a million dollars. But have you done them over the past five years? Every year you're doing 200,000. That means that your business is stable. But if the growth rate is 200% year over year, it means that it's a growing business. So it's not just a business that's generating revenue, it's a business that's growing and thriving. What are the number of customers? Who are these customers? So sometimes people tell us, okay, we just started, we don't have enough numbers. We only have three customers. Maybe these customers are leaders in their markets. So if they trusted you, it gives you credibility. So that's the type of figures and numbers and examples you want to give to investors to make them feel safe about investing in your company. And then there's the scalability. So you've communicated your numbers. You want to say that these numbers are going to grow even further in the upcoming years. Right? So you need to communicate that scalability process. So in terms of numbers, figures, so how these revenues are going to resonate in a few years' time, or it could be from a technology point of view, how your solution is going to look like in the future, what are you going to act with, things that are going to differentiate even further. It could be in terms of expansion, geographical expansion, so you're operating in a certain market, and you want to tell them that in a few years you'll be in a different country as well, or in different cities, and that will, of course, reflect on the numbers and so on. And then the team. And we always say investors invest in teams, not in ideas. So you always hear about that idea that sounds very basic and sounds very uh, normal and already exists in the market. But then you see a startup doing it and raising a huge volume of funding. $10 million in funding, $50 million, and then you look at the idea and you don't know why it took all of that funding, right? But then you look at the team behind it and they, you find that they're very experienced, they've done multiple startups before, they've succeeded before, they have the right amount of experience, they're specialized, they're in harmony, they know what they're doing, they know how to invest the money. So that's what you want to communicate to investors, right? We have the right people behind the solution. 
it's not just a fancy tech solution, it's not just a, an attractive industry, it's not just a real problem that's affecting people. We haven't just generated numbers by luck. It's not just about the standard business model, no, it's about us. You're investing in us. We're going to make your money safe. We're going to make it more profitable in the future. So that's an extremely crucial point. And that's why we usually put it near the end, because it's one of the points that you want people to remember after the presentation. Then last but not least is the ask. So what do you want from the investor? So what number, what figure are you looking for? So you need a million dollars, you need to mention that. And you need to say bluntly, are you looking for a million dollars to spend in four main departments in our store? So the operations, the marketing, hiring the, hiring the team, and so on. So, so you need to say the number, you need to say why you need it, and the areas you're going to spend. Now these are 12 points any invested pitch deck should include. And it doesn't matter how long the pitch deck is. Usually it's three minutes, four minutes. You have to say all 12 components in those three minutes. And trust me, three minutes is more than enough for all 12. It sounds hard when you listen to it for the first time, but all you need to do is to hook the attention of the audience so that they want a meeting with you after the pitch. So they don't take a, an investment decision after three minutes, right? There are meetings, there are extensive talks, there are negotiations, there's plenty of time, you're going to explain each and every single point in a separate meeting. But you want to get that meeting, and that's the point behind an investor pitch then. So you need to choose a sentence or two for every single point that hooks the attention of the audience. They say a standard person talks 150 words a minute. That's the average. So I've been talking an average of 150 words a minute. So if it's three minutes, that's 450 words. So you need to communicate 12 points in 450 words. That gives you almost two sentences each. Right? So two sentences is enough for every point of those because you're only hitting the headlines, that you've done the numbers, that you have a very diverse and sustainable business model, that you have a very experienced and specialized team, that you can reach your customers. And when you do, the solution is very easy for them to use, and so on. Now, let me show you an example. I'm not showing it to you because it's a great example. It's just an example, and I want to discuss with you what are the things you think is done in a good way, the things you could have improved. So let's listen to it and then discuss it. These are delivery here, so they're a multi-billion dollar company today. That was 10 years ago or 12 years ago, and they were pitching the idea for one of the very first times ever. We offer restaurant food delivery in under 45 minutes. And for restaurant owners, we provide our own drivers and we manage the logistics of delivery. Now, you might think that food delivery is a solved problem. But if you live in Menlo Park or Palo Alto, you know that's not true. Outside of pizza joints, just about no restaurant in this area delivers. Therefore, services like Seamless or Grubhub which merely aggregate menus but don't actually deliver, don't work. In fact, that means the market is underserved because over 70% of the United States live in areas where the restaurants don't deliver. Now, there are courier services who are sending people to, take, to place takeout orders on your behalf, but because they don't partner with the merchants, they are slower and structurally more expensive. We're the only company in this space that manages both our own logistics and partners with the merchants. 
we figured out the model to make consumer deliveries work. Because we control the entire experience of delivery, we offer the best performance at the same cost. When an order is made in our system, it gets placed immediately at an iPad installed at the restaurant. We've also built logistics software to make it that simple for any driver to onboard into our network. Our logistics model is winning. In over 3,500 deliveries, we average 44 minute delivery times between when you place your order and when you receive your food. Better than our peers. But unlike our peers who operate in the cities, we did this in the suburb of Palo Alto, an area that's much more spread out and more difficult. Because of our great service, we grow our weekly orders at over 30% week over week. And we've already generated over $1.5 million in annualized sales for our restaurants. We figured out how to make consumer deliveries work. Our growth proves that. But what's more, our driver network and logistics software enables us to even go beyond food. If you were building the fetish of today to manage local deliveries, deliveries wouldn't happen overnight or even the same day. They will happen on demand. And that's what we're building at DoorDash. If you're interested in hearing more, please come find us afterwards. Thank you. Yes, but that was a two minute pitch, by the way. So he, he communicated a lot of points in two minutes, but yes, he dropped the marketing strategy. So that's a, a good point. But he, he, he communicated how he reaches the restaurants, but he didn't communicate how he reaches the end consumers. Yeah, go ahead. Um, he, he was able to show instruction, but you don't know what he wants. You Sorry? He hasn't asked them. The ask, yes. He didn't communicate the ask. Well, we don't understand the context of the presentation. Maybe it was uh, in a demo day, for example, or it was in front of customers. We don't understand the context, but it was missing the ask. But he successfully communicated the attraction. I guess in just two sentences, he showed how much he's growing. So he said that you can add so much value that we made 30% growth week over week, and we made $1.5 million since our inception. So two sentences, but it showed how much the business is growing. However, we didn't understand what exactly is he looking for in that picture. What else? Anything else? His team. His team. Who is the people behind it? But an uh, 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 interesting fact here, at the time, he was the only founder. He didn't have a team. So he was trying to find a way to navigate his way around. Of course, now there are very extensive and huge team behind DoorDash, but at that time he was the solo founder and he didn't have a team. So he later said that he couldn't actually communicate that in speeches because it would uh, get him business away from the idea. Uh, any, did you guys notice? Yeah. I liked how he brought out the Yes, they don't operate in suburb areas. They take a lot of time to deliver orders, even in the city. He found a more uh, operationally efficient way to do that in the suburbs. And he communicated that with numbers. So it wasn't just his opinion. He said it took them 68 minutes to do so in the cities. He made it to 44 in the suburbs. So he actually uh, uh, documented it with solid numbers that makes it very hard for people to argue against. Okay. Now, tips are using numbers in the pitch. The first one, if you can, use percentages, not solid figures, because percentages reflect something. Right? So, 30% growth is different than achieving 20,000 pounds a month, right? So the growth shows something about where the business is going. Plus, most startup founders they face an issue with just starting. They don't have really big numbers, so they want to find a way around that. So if you say to investors that you've done only ten thousand pounds, 
they're not going to be very attracted to your company. <coughs> but if you tell them that it's been a 300% growth rate, month over month, <laughs> they don't know yet that this means that the first month you actually made 1,000 pounds and then 3,000 pounds and then six or 9,000 pounds, right? So it's a way to navigate your way around having small numbers. Now, the second thing is to link to a time frame. So a number on its own may sound good, but if you link it to a time frame, it's going to sound even better. So if you generated 100,000 pounds, might sound okay. But if you say that you generated 100,000 pounds in the first six weeks of operations, now that's a different meaning and a different context to that number. So always link your numbers to time frames because it's going to show investors that you were able to do so much in so little time. Now the third thing is the potential. So what is it expected to become? So you generated 100,000 pounds. Interesting thing here is if you continue with the same growth rates till the end of the year, by the end of the year, that 100,000 is going to be a million and a half pounds. And that's why we're looking for investment, because it's, it's going to help us sustain the growth rate to the end of the year. And I see that's a different meaning to the number. Now, the fourth thing is to use relative market figures, like the guy from Duradash did. So he could have said, we deliver orders in 24 minutes, and that's amazing. Right? But what he said that the average market delivery time is 68 minutes, and I deliver it in 44, he made it very competitive. He made it very relative to the market. So now people really see the value behind what he's doing. Uh, last but not least is compare and contrast. So there might be similar ideas that have been executed before in different geographies, for example. And they reached wild successes, and they had successful exit stories, or become, became unicorns, or whatever. Now, you have a similar problem, you have a similar solution, and you're actually doing better numbers than they did at that phase of their uh, lifespan. So you want to communicate that, compare what are the differences, and make a contrast, and make things look very optimistic. Now these are key numbers that usually you find investors very interested in. Okay? So when we say communicate numbers, these are uh, some of the numbers we're talking about. Now the first one are the revenues. By the way guys, if you want to get a presentation, you can just send us an email and we'll communicate that presentation with you. Right? Now the attraction includes the revenues, how much you've done. MRR, so the monthly recurring revenues, or ARR, that's the annual recurring revenues. So how much of those revenues are recurring every month? So a customer may be paying $100 every month as subscription till the end of the year, right? So that's a recurring revenue. And the total revenues you've achieved, that would be a million dollars today. And the second thing is the number of customers, the users, the install base. Third thing is, do you have any key customers? So sometimes a startup comes to us and they say, okay, we have only three customers. Now, if we say three customers, no one's going to invest in us, right? So we need to find a way. So we don't say we have three customers, the way you communicate it is. Now we're working with one of the leading pharmaceutical companies in the world, and we're working with a very famous academic institute the US and we would so you're talking about key customers who if actually trusted you then you have a credible solution and you have something that's generating value. And the return on ad spend is a good example also so that we would see uh, if it's something related to me, you're talking about the marketing efficiency and how you're reaching customers and all of that you want to show that you already know and have uh, the capability of reaching your customers in the most efficient ways. And if you've got previous investments, what you've done with it, where you've reached afterwards, and so on. And of course, there are the unit economics. So, 
speaking of the customer acquisition cost. How much do you spend to acquire one customer? And the lifetime value. How much does that customer spend in the business throughout his lifetime? And things like the retention rates. How many of those customers return back and reuse your service? And the cost, the cost of goods sold. You're selling something, you're paying money to acquire customers, and then you're paying money on the goods itself as a cost. And then he spends time he spends the money back into the business, right? He pays for that service. That's the lifetime value. So the investor makes a quick calculation and sees the difference between the lifetime value should outweigh all of the costs and the more it outweighs them, the better and more profitable the business looks. Now, finally, the ask. So what are you asking? The amount, the equity in return that you want to give to the investor for that money and the distribution of those funds across the different segments. What are you going to do with that money? Are you going to spend it in uh, distribution? Are you going to send it, spend it on marketing? Are you going to spend it on operations, on hiring a team? Whatever that is. Now, here's another pitch I want you to uh, listen to and let's discuss it afterwards. The reason I put that pitch in the presentation is that he actually built the whole pitch deck on numbers. So he spent so little time on the solution that he spent most of the pitch on communicating numbers with the audience. So let's listen to it and then discuss it.
what do you think of the business? So what, what's your impression about the business? Growing. Growing? Okay. Lots of competition. Lots of competition, but that was 10 years ago. Especially with, with the delivery, you know? People, they, you know, companies, they provide delivery. Yes. And he started his uh, pitch with, uh, no. With we are not. We are not, yeah. Exactly. That's not the, the best way to start the uh, Exactly. Uh, because he still didn't communicate what he is. He communicated what he is. And he is it. So exactly. that's a common mistake. So that's a very good point. Uh, he's not doing something new, but at the time it was newer than it is today. So that was almost 10 years ago. It was in, uh, that's a, a YC uh, pitch, the day pitch. So that was in 2011, I guess, if I remember correctly. So by then, that was an idea that wasn't very common, but yes, it existed. It looked growing at the time. What else? Any other feedback? Yes, yeah, like I was saying, I think he spent too much on the numbers, that like it overwhelmed everything. If you can see or understand what the numbers were, but we need a bit more, I would think. He made it a bit confusing, I guess, yeah. because there was yeah. too much numbers and the key mistake here that people do when they communicate numbers is moving between timelines a lot. So he went to the future, he said that it's gonna reach that potential, then he went back to a historic point, and then he went back to the future, and then he spoke about other cities, and then he came back to the existing numbers of today. So moving across different time frames when talking about numbers makes it very confusing. So it has to be very structured and organized because Numbers, even though they are solid documentation and they are very good ways to communicate your success and your potential, but if used wrongly, they're going to overwhelm your audience. So you need to use them right and put them in their place and make them very structured and logical in their flow. Anything else? Okay. You know, that company is actually closed. So they failed after all of that potential and growth rates, they actually failed and they closed a few years later. But I think if there were investors in the audience at the time, I think they could have been very interested. And they got a few rounds of funding after that pitch and the years that followed. But of course, not everything that's communicated is actually true, right? And there's a lot of optimism in what people usually say in their pitches. But that's the whole point. It's one thing to put thought and effort into growing your business. It's one other thing to put thought and effort into communicating that growth and making people want to know more about it and be engaged with it and to hook their attention and to say it in a way that sticks in their minds. So that's how important pitches are. You may be communicating an idea that's not you, that's already existing with a lot of competition, that's not really growing. It has no unique setting points or whatever. But if you communicate it in the right way, you can actually get what you want out of the pitch, whether that's funding or closing a deal or winning a competition or sealing a partnership or whatever. Okay. Uh, I want to give you a few tips. Now we're done with the content part. I want to give you a few tips about the uh, interpersonal skills part. So remember when we talked about what are the key pillars of a perfect pitch deck, we said there are three things. There's you, the presenter, and we talked about points like the body language, like the confidence, like the tone of voice you're using, like the movement on stage, like the interaction and communication with the audience, all of these things. <coughs> we said there's the content, and then we said there's the visuals. Right? The three key pillars. We talked about the content, I'm going to give you a few tips and tricks about the speaker part, what you should do. And one thing in particular we see a lot of people struggling with is the confidence. So you have a very important presentation, you're pitching to investors or you're pitching to customers and practically your life depends on it. It's something that's going to affect your business massively. And of course that makes you stressed, it makes you uh, anxious. Usually, there's a lot of people who have stage fright. Speaking in front of a large group of people is very stressful. 
So what should you do about that? Now, the key point that you should remember, always remember, it's not whether you're nervous. It's whether you show it. So it's normal that you're stressed, it's normal that you're anxious. But what are the things to do to not show that stress? That's the whole thing. There's nothing you can do to make you not stressed. Because these are hormones. It's adrenaline, it's testosterone, it's cortisol. Stress for more. There are things that once you're in a very important situation are automatically going to be there and you can't do anything about that. Right? So if you listen to a public speaking trainer, for example, telling you that there are ways to not feel stress, that's never going to happen. You may, you may become better in dealing with it, but it's not just going to go away. If the situation is important, you're going to feel that. But the, the more practice you put, the better you're going to deal with it. And the key play here is what to do to not show it. So you might be feeling very, very stressed from inside you, but once you're speaking in front of people, they have no idea about that. Now, let me give you a quick tactic that you could use if you're stressed and that people will never know that you're that stressed. It's called the five S's technique. So it's five things that start with an S that if you do, people will never know how stressed you are. Uh, the first S is the stance. It's the way you stand. So people who are very stressed, you'll find them fidgeting a lot from one leg to the other, moving in circles, right? Upwards and backwards. They don't move steadily across the room. They move from one step, then they get stressed that they're getting nearer to the audience, so they take a step back. They hold their hands in a defensive position, and that's a defensive position, right? They put their hands in front of them, that's another defensive position. They hold the pencil and they keep doing things like that. They keep on pulling on their shirts. These are all things that happen out of stress. Now, how does a confident stance look like? You need to stand straight and still. So straight and still. You shouldn't move unless it's in a steady position and straight. If you put your shoulders upwards, that's stress. A person is stressed. Pushes his shoulders a bit up. Should, should be downwards and straight. Your head should be at the same level as that of the eyes of the audience. If you're looking from upwards, that's a bit ignorant. If you're looking downwards, you're a bit shy. Your legs should be at the same position as your shoulders. So if they're too open, it looks strange. If it's too close, looks incompetent. Girls usually, when they're shy, they close their legs. So it should be as, at the same level as that of the shoulders. Your shoulders should be downwards, your eyes should be at the same level as that of the audience, and your hands should be one of two things. They're next to you, or that position. If you pull it upwards, that's defensive. It should be downwards. If you clench it, again, that's stress. Just relax them. Yeah. Then you make your body language, you talk to the audience, you do everything you want with your hands, shouldn't be distracting guided, and then they should be turned back to their positions. Now that's the right stance. Okay, now the second S is the smile. You need to smile at least twice in presentation at least twice. So when you smile, people feel relaxed looking at you and you feel relaxed looking at you. When people do long presentations, they're too stressed, they frown, and it's just gives the wrong vibes and impression throughout the presentation. It makes everything tense, it makes it too serious. They need to at least smile 
the beginning of the presentation, and maybe at the solution part, and maybe at the conclusion part. So an average of three times, but never less than twice. I get a lot of, uh, of um, questions people tell me when they're too afraid of a presentation. It's too hard to smile, and they can't fake it because when you fake it, people know, right? Now here's an interesting fact. There's a way that you can use that you can't smile at all at the beginning of a presentation. If you actually do, you're gonna smile very easily after that. Okay? So they say if you take a pencil and you put it in your mouth for three seconds, once you take that pencil away, you're gonna find yourself smiling very widely. Okay? Let me show you. I'll have that to <clears throat> Here's a serious look. Hello everyone. <laughs> this is Albert from Take and Talk. You know why? Because these two bones, once you widen them, by logic you can just get them back into place immediately. It takes a few seconds, three, four seconds. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm not telling you to stand in front of your audience and do like that. <laughs> just, uh, don't do that, okay? But there are cheeky ways to do it. So you might be doing something in your laptop, you still haven't started your presentation yet, so you're just like typing or something. <laughs> okay, hello everyone, this is Omar from Think and Talk. See? So you go with that passion, with that voice, with that smile, they're gonna feel that you're so calm, even though you're not, but you look that way. No, I don't think with most people, with most people, I don't think you face that issue. But and, and usually, audiences they're never afraid of smiles, right? So they're not gonna feel disappointed that you smile. And once you smile, it's gonna reflect back on the audience, right? So you guys are smiling now because I was just smiling. Now the third thing is the sound. So when someone's stressed, if you talk very no voice or a shaky voice and that's a direct result of the, the breathing when someone's stressed breathing is shaky so the sound comes away shaky as well right so the right way to sound is you need to sound high and clear the voice comes out of three places right so you come from the nose you come from the throat to come away from the diaphragm, from that part. If you want to know how it sounds coming out from that part, take a breath and talk while pushing away that breath. Hello everyone, this is all. Right? So that way, that's the way you should sound in any part of the presentation. Of course, you should lower your voice at certain points, then make it higher again, so you're not going to talk. Now the fourth S is the complete opposite. Silence. And it's very important. Putting pauses in the presentation. Taking to talking, it starts to get distracting after a while. But if at certain points you put pauses, it shows that you're talking. So you're talking to your audience and talking about the problem and then about the solution you're saying that all of that happened as a result of one thing that if you were actually capable of resolutioning it then you're actually going to be able to take away all of that problem and that one thing we should focus on is the budget put enough effort into optimizing the budget Everything is going to be different. See? So if you put a pause before it, a pause after it, it's like you're putting brackets around that point. And while you're pausing, everyone's looking at you, you're looking back at them, so it conveys a sense of confidence. Now, the last S is the sight, the eyes. When someone's stressed, either he looks at the slides, starts breathing properly for a long time and he doesn't look at the audience or he looks at a specific part of the room 
So say, for example, that part of the room, they're actually nice people and they're smiling at me, so I felt comfortable with them, so I started talking to them and neglecting all the other people in the room. That's a very common mistake. But if you're confident, your eyes should move across everyone in the room. There's a, a rule they call the Z rule. Your eyes should be moving in a Z shape, but in slow motion. Right, so I start from there, I move from there, and then I come here, and then I move back here. And then I repeat, but in very, very <coughs> slow motion. Right, so these are five things. If you do, no matter how stressed you are, no one's gonna know. So you stand in front of people, you're straight, you're still, you're smiling, you talk the high volume sound. Hello everyone. This is X. I'm going to X and we're here today to tell you a story. You look at them and you put a pause. And then you start talking. No matter how feel inside, they won't know about it. It's only going to be you. And that's the practice part. You're going to practice how to keep speaking while feeling the stress inside. And understanding that no one feels it other than you. And it's okay that you feel it. It's just a trick that you need to employ so that no one else in the room understands how you feel. Right? Okay. Now, one of the final tips I want to give you is about the hands, because it's very important. You can either don't use their hands at all, and that gives away the 55% of the body language we talked about, or they use it in the wrong way, in a way that's very distracting. So you know, the speakers who keep doing like the same gesture with their hands, after a while it's very distracting and very disturbing, and it starts to Intimidating. Now, what should you do with your hands? The top most efficient way of employing your hands, they call it the palms up, palms down. The palms up, palms down. So when you're speaking, you want to be open with your palms, you want to be inviting, you want to be engaging. So you use that gesture. It's a palms up gesture. Now when, when, once you're saying a fact, saying something that you're 100% sure of and that it's something that is considered a fact about your business and you don't want it to be even questioned, you use the other way around. This number doesn't exist in today's industry. It's not there. And if anyone has any questions, so once you get it back, the palms up, it starts getting it by the ask more now. But that part, 100% sure of, right? So that's when you're saying a fact, and that's when you're open and engaging and inviting and want to interact with your own. Now the second thing is to act the words, and that's important. So consider the show. Remember the when we did that game, and you all got confused? You said that because it has to be visual, right? So you need to make it visual to the audience. Every sentence you say has to be visual. So I'm going to speak about three things in today's presentation. If you don't do that part, all of the focus is on what they're hearing, not what they're seeing. And people see it first and then listen. Okay? So always remember that game, and that's how you should do it in a presentation. You should make your sentences visual. So we're going to speak about three things. It's a cycle. We start here, and then we go here, and then we leave it there. Now, the industry average is 80%. We went to 95%. That difference lies within our own technology. Right? So once you, you made it visual that there's a difference, it sticks in their mind. Now, the last thing is the chop, right? It's not possible to do that any other way. We've tried so many solutions. That's the only way it works. 
once you do that job, you make it sound fine. And that's important in certain parts of the presentation. Okay, last thing we're going to talk about is the voice. To avoid the monotonic voice, there are four things that you should play with with your tonality. The first one is the volume. So sometimes you need to be high volume, sometimes very low volume. You use the high volume when you're passionate and you're speaking and you want to tell them that you did a lot of effort, but you use the low volume when you say the most important parts of the presentation. You know when you're telling someone a secret, <coughs> whisper. It's the same. We did all of that in six months. So people start to listen, to lean forward, to listen to what you say. The second thing is the pace. You're passionate, you're excited, you're talking about your idea, you're speaking quickly, and you're telling a lot of facts. But then there's a part of the presentation that everyone should pay attention to. start talking in a very slow pace. Now that variation between very quick and very low avoids the monotonic problem. The third one is the inflection. So sometimes people they close their sentences upwards and sometimes downwards. Upwards is when there's another sentence coming out. Hello everyone, I'm Omar Kameda, I'm from Tech and Talks, we have people deliver presentations that are engaged. See, every sentence is open-ended, it's like there's another sentence coming afterwards. Then there's another way. Hello everyone, I'm Omar Kameda from Tech and Talks. I close the sentence, it's like a fact. And you should include that in key parts of the presentation. For example, when you say your numbers, you don't want to just say that you landed many customers and you get great traction and you generated a million dollars in your first two years and that number is not just going to stay there but it's actually going to, you don't want to say it that. Now, we've done so many numbers, we've landed so many customers but the key thing here is that revenues we've made have surpassed 1.5 million dollars in the last six months. Close the sentence. So that's the downward inflection. And the last thing is the energy behind the quotes, the passion. Right? So remember when we said the voice comes out of three places the nose, the throat, or the diaphragm? Energetic voices come out of the diaphragm. So when you speak, you need to show the passion, the energy behind your idea. Right? So it has to come from the diaphragm, it has to be high volume, you need to speak with passion so you've got to speak quickly. The inflection is variant across the presentation and it's always very energetic. If you play in these four roles, you're going to have a voice that actually engages audiences to the very end of the presentation. I'm going to show you a uh, way how actually don't have time, but I want to thank you all for the uh, for coming today and for meeting. And if you have any questions, I would love to help. I do. And uh, what is the perfect duration timing for the presentation? Depends on the content and the context as well. So we were speaking. If it's a startup pitch deck, you want it to be three to five minutes. If it's a technical solution that you're presenting to a customer. We say the average is 10 minutes because then the presentation won't end but you want to turn it into a discussion. If it's a session, if you're teaching an audience something, it would be 30 minutes or an hour. And the rest would be a discussion. So it depends on the content and the context of the presentation. Thank you. My name is just a comment that uh, I find it very strange but also interesting that. Um, 
you have to use the low level of the most Yes, many people think that. The thing is, when, when you understand presentation skills very well and you practice a lot, you start relating to a lot of presentations with audiences, you find that speaking in a loud voice doesn't necessarily mean that you say something important or that the audience is engaged in you. In fact, it's the other way around. Once people are very engaged, and we're listening very carefully to what you're saying. If you drop a pin, they'll hear it. Right? And they might be leaning forward, they want to know more, they want to ask questions, everything. So once everyone is quiet, once everyone is listening to you, drop all the options in front of you. You want to use these options to be efficient. Once you say it in a low volume, make people want to listen. That's the effect you want to I think it's interesting that when you, when a person presents, they use words like we, our, my business, because that makes it personal and makes the person interact with who they are. When you talk about yes. pay or, or, or owning your business and owning your, 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 your business proposal, it's important that you don't use third-person language. But I'll, I'll tell you something. I think that's a mistake. Yeah. When you speak in a presentation, you shouldn't be talking about my business, our team, or our solution, or that, <coughs> that pronoun. You should be talking about the audience, always. Now, when you deliver a presentation, you should be doing that. And I'm talking to you guys, right? I'm talking to each and every single one of you, personally. If I'm saying, if I'm saying, while I'm doing a presentation, I should be doing that. When I'm talking, my voice should be like that. You'll find that I'm actually talking about myself. Eventually, you're going to think, okay, maybe that problem is not very relevant to me. I never face that issue. But when I'm talking to you as a customer, or as an investor, or as someone I care about, I want you to feel that it's all about you. So when you pitch your business, you should be pitching it that way. You should always use the you pronoun when speaking in the audience. Any other questions? All good? Thank you. Thank you so much, guys.